brilliant feats of engineering and acts of suicidal bravery will mark the collision between the ancient world's two greatest superpowers, Rome and Carthage. It will be a fight to the death and the outcome will change the course of Western history. Welcome to Tunisia. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. When I was a kid, I heard the name Carthage, and I knew it was an ancient city. I didn't know exactly where it was. I'd heard of Hannibal and the elephants crossing the Alps and these famous wars with Rome. And I learned these wars were called Punic Wars after the Latin word Punici, which is what Rome called Carthage. But I had no idea where Carthage was. Well, it was here in the northern tip of Tunisia, and behind me is the modern capital of Tunis, a city of about two million people sitting on the Mediterranean Sea. By the fourth century BC, Carthage was an absolute empire dominating the Mediterranean with a formidable navy. But the original legend of Carthage starts in the eastern Mediterranean city of Tyre. The Phoenician city of Tyre and a beautiful woman named Dido, and the jealousy and greed and lust for power that would absolutely rip a royal family apart. Dido was the beautiful daughter of King Matan. Her husband was an ambitious Phoenician who had met an untimely end. He was murdered by her brother, Pygmalion. Terrified for her life, Dido fled across the Mediterranean from her homeland of Tyre to a no man's land at the northern tip of Africa. There she bargained with the native people to buy as much land as could be covered with the hide of an ox. Clever and cunning, Dido cut the hide into the thinnest of strips, then arranged them to enclose a large section of fertile land. There, under her governing hand, the fantastic Carthadash, or new city, would be engineered. When they came to Carthage, sized up the bay, looked at the mountains, looked at the flow of the rivers, looked at a place, the Bursa, which would be a great defensible fortress site, they said, this is it. This is where we will build our city. Dido's settlement, Carthage, quickly prospered. According to legend, tales of its wealth and Dido's beauty spread all the way to Erebus, king of the Moors. Part of Dido's story is this tale of the king of the Libyan natives, Yarbas, who wishes to marry her, but she refuses to do so. According to the storytellers, it's out of love for her assassinated husband, and she climbs onto a self-built funeral pyre and burns herself up. It was here, from her ashes, that one of the greatest empires in the known world would rise. Surrounded by bigger powers and with little land, the Phoenicians of Carthage turned to the sea. They were pioneers, pragmatic, open to new ideas, and endlessly innovative. When Dido established the city, the new city, a lot of people's eyes obviously opened wide and said, hey, a new city, a new start. And as these trading routes that Carthage pioneered expanded, it very rapidly became as international a city as any anywhere then in the world. Over the next 200 years, Carthage evolves into a major Mediterranean power, establishing colonies in Corsica, Ibiza, and North Africa. By around 700, maybe 650 BC, Carthage is a force to be reckoned with. Everybody's heard of it, nobody messes with it. It's a very important city. Through expansive trade networks, by the 7th century BC, Carthage's new territories were generating a massive treasure chest. And its population reached 300,000, making it one of the biggest cities in the world. To some extent, you could compare it to a Manhattan. This is a huge population living in a relatively small area. So this is an important commercial and cultural hub, not only for North Africa, but also for the entire Western Mediterranean world. Before the Carthaginians' grand engineering feats had been launched in the name of the gods, Carthage's focus was closer to home, 
Like America 2,500 years later, the wealth of Carthage drew legions of people looking to make their fortune. Soon the city's architects and engineers had to find a way to house them all, a challenge that would lead to the most remarkable urban building boom in antiquity. There was something very important to the Carthaginian spirit, to its psyche, about staying within the walls of Carthage. So the pressure to design buildings that would accommodate people who wanted to live within the city was very strong. The Carthaginians would be the first on a massive level to turn the city's sky into private property by building apartments. These were as high as six stories, very densely populated. Why? Because people wanted to come to Carthage. It was a successful, happening place. If you wanted to get on in life, you wanted to come to Carthage. To build a city for the ages, first they would need materials with which to build it. The answer was located at El Hawaria on Tunis Bay. There in these remote quarries, was a seemingly endless supply of limestone that was both easy to work with and quick to put up. Limestone is the perfect choice for building. And there were limestone depositions geologically in that area, in that basin, very close at hand. Archaeologists speculate that like the Egyptians before them, the Carthaginians cut each block of stone using the simplest of means, water and wood. After they've chiseled a dotted line channel along the face of a rock, they take a wooden wedge, stick it in there, if it's deep enough, and then wet the wood. And what will happen naturally is the wood will expand with the water, and then it'll naturally crack the stone. The increased pressure from the expanding wood caused the stone to crack in almost perfect lines. From there, workers separated each block using crowbars and other tools. Once the massive blocks of stone were quarried and transported to the city, the Carthaginians used pier and panel style construction to quickly transform Carthage into a dynamic capital. It's very clear that by using stone in the first place, they weren't ready to pick up and go elsewhere. They were looking down the long term. For each metropolis to survive, it needs a constant source of running water. Carthage was no different, so the ancient city engineers turned to cisterns, like this. Each cistern was made of a double layer of eggshell, ash, and clay, made the cistern absolutely watertight. Every home enjoyed access to a cistern through a series of pipes and channels. Carthaginians had fully equipped bathrooms with tubs and sinks and even showers years before ancient Rome. When we have clear evidence way before the foundation of Carthage of domestic plumbing. But it is Carthage by 600 BC or thereabouts, and certainly Carthaginian town of Kirkwain by 450 BC, that we have the first evidence of a unified system of water usage and, critically, sewage. Any fool can put in a bathroom, but the question is what you do with the waste water. And at Kirkwain, you see very clearly a unified single system that has piped water to the rooms that need it, the kitchen and the bathroom, but then piping the waste water out to a common sewage system. This was evolutionary, yes, but it is also typically Carthaginian because it's also revolutionary. By the 6th century BC, Carthage was growing into a true city-state, brimming with magnificent temples, glittering palaces, and high-rise houses. But as Carthage's flame burned brighter, the flame of their Phoenician cousins was burning out. The great Phoenician city of Tyre fell to the Babylonians in 574 BC. Carthage was now on its own. Before long, the Carthaginians would sail beyond the dusty shores of North Africa, continuing to expand their empire by conquering the seas. The Carthaginians saved money by covering their stone houses with smooth stucco, making them appear to be constructed of expensive marble. 520 BC, 
3,000 oars propel 60 ships through the Pillars of Hercules, known today as the Straits of Gibraltar. Hanno the Navigator, the great admiral of Carthage, is sailing to the edges of the known world. He is preparing to launch a power play that could lead to total domination of the Mediterranean. So every great explorer, Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, who sailed off into the unknown, seems to me a very strong parallel for the original and best of them, Hanno the Navigator. Hanno set sail to extend the boundaries of the Carthaginian network of colonies and exchange, not mere trading activities, but planting whole cities of new settlers to maintain control of land and access to its resources. Carthage's technical prowess on the seas has brought it power and wealth. By the 6th century BC, the islands of Corsica, Sardinia, and the Balearic Islands are now under its control. The hub of its power flows from a marvel of engineering, the harbor of Carthage. This is the absolute pinnacle of Carthaginian engineering. Although records are shaky, archaeologists believe it may have been constructed as early as the days of Hanno. But at the height of her power, in the second century BC, the harbor of Carthage was transformed technologically superior to any maritime facility in the world and the very lifeblood of Carthage. It was part of Carthage, it was the heart of Carthage, it was the lungs of Carthage, it was everything to Carthage, both naval and commercial. The harbor had a common entrance from the sea that was 70 feet wide, which could be closed with iron chains. Inside its gates were two separate marinas, the first for the traders and merchant vessels. The mercantile harbor, the commercial harbor, was organized with conventional wharves to make uh, as easy as possible the loading and unloading of goods. So in Carthage, readily one can imagine in, say, 400 BC, you would see all the goods there were in the then known world being bought, being brought, being sold in Carthage. The second, a circular harbor, was designed for military use. A series of 30 docks were arranged symmetrically. Another 140 additional berths radiated out on the perimeter of the circular port, allowing the entire harbor to hold 220 boats. Today, a lone dry dock has been excavated. A reminder of the strength the harbor once commanded. This is all that's left of the Cothon, or military harbor of ancient Carthage. A Cothon was an interior port carved out of the land as opposed to an exterior port attached to the seaside. Now, with all these beautiful villas around here, it's kind of hard to imagine that this harbor was the launch point for the wealth and power of ancient Carthage. Now, the nerve center for this maritime hub was that circular island out there where there were 40 or 50 slots for boat dry dock. And on top of that island was a big tower where trumpeters would blare signals and heralds would deliver orders and admirals 